Well, good morning. It's uh, great to be back. I certainly missed uh, being with you all yesterday, but I'm thankful uh, to be back and looking forward to today and the rest of the week. If you are new this week, I want to welcome you. We're so glad that you're here. We uh, last week were looking in the book of Philippians at Philippians chapter one and chapter two, and we've been talking about having a courageous faith. We've been talking about the need for a courageous faith. And as Paul wrote to the church in Philippi, a church that he loved dearly, a church that he helped found, and, and he's writing from Rome, he's in prison for the, his faith in the gospel and his ministry to, of the gospel. And he writes to the church in Philippi to encourage them and to remind them of some things. And one of the things that I think throughout the letter it's apparent is that he knew that they needed a courageous faith that in order to handle life, in order to follow Jesus, in order to live for Jesus in a world that was, that was, in a world that was very hostile to the gospel, in a world that was hostile to Jesus, they needed to have a courageous faith. And so we're going to continue that theme this week, and we're going to be in chapters 3 and chapters 4 of the book of Philippians as Paul continues to, to share with the church. And our goal, our, our theme is this, is to, to develop an undeterred trust in God despite the danger, fear, and pain that we face. And undeterred, it, just to remind you, it means persevering despite the setbacks. Right? So our, our faith journey isn't perfect. It, it isn't this steady line of growth. There's ups and there's downs and there's, there's moments of, of great growth and there's moments of discouragement or failure or setbacks. But I want you to have a faith that is undeterred. And to have an ability to trust God and to trust in God despite the danger, fear, and pain that we all face. So that's our goal and what we're looking at. And this morning we're going to look at Philippians chapter 3, verses 1 through 11. Uh, this is a, a particularly dense portion of, of Philippians, and we could spend hours, but I'm not allowed to do that, and you can rejoice in that. So we're not going to spend hours, but, but even though there, there's so much in these verses, we're not going to really begin to be able to uncover everything that's here. But what I do want you to see is that in these 11 verses, there's a simple and yet profound, utterly profound reminder for all of us that if we're going to develop and live out a courageous faith, we need to have something. And that thing is a genuine relationship with Christ. If you're going to have a courageous faith, you need a genuine relationship with Christ. Now, some of you might be thinking, well, yeah, right? Like, that's kind of obvious. And, and while it might seem obvious on the surface, sadly, many people, and maybe even you, have tried to live the Christian life without actually knowing Christ. Many people have tried to live the Christian life and have an appearance of living a Christian life but they don't actually know Christ. And so as Paul's writing to the church, to those who claim to follow Jesus and have placed their faith and trust in Him alone and are followers of Him, he writes to them to remind them that faith requires a genuine relationship with Christ. So let's dive in and begin with verse 1. Philippians chapter 3 and beginning in verse 1. Paul says, Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord, to write to you again about this is no trouble for me, and it is a protection to you or for you. So he says, finally, that, that word finally means, means towards the rest. And so it's sort of a transition word as we move in chapter 2 to chapter 3. And of course, when Paul wrote this letter, he didn't have chapters and verses. They were added much later so that we could find things and organize things. But this is a sort of a natural breaking point in his letter. And so he says, towards the rest, he says, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. Joy is one of the themes of Philippians. And for Paul, he always found his joy in the Lord and in and through relationships with other believers. In fact, Paul often ties his experience of God's joy to how other believers are doing and the relationship that they shared. And so our joy comes from God. It's a gift from God, but it's something we experience and share with one another. So he says, to write to you again is, it's no trouble for me, it's protection for you, it's a joy for me. And then he says something sort of curious, he says, watch out for the dogs, verse 2. 
Watch out for evil workers. Watch out for those who mutilate the flesh. And so Paul's giving us some warnings here. He says, watch out, right? When someone tells you to watch out, right, there's usually what ahead? Danger, right? Watch out. Or how many of you have a mom that tells you to be careful? Anybody? All right. I'm, I'm not going to say how old I am. I'm really old. Um, my mom will still tell me at times, I'll be talking on the phone, be careful, right? Because right? moms never stop being moms. And so Paul here, he says, watch out, be careful. And he says, watch out for dogs. How many of you find that a little puzzling? Right? Because when you think about dogs, a lot of us, a lot of us think about something like this, right? Right, who, who's going to, this is just some random dog from the internet, not my dog. Sorry, just total transparency there. All right, but he says, go back to that verse, he says, watch out for dogs, and we think, Watch out for dogs. What is he talking about? To, middle, uh, to Eastern people in the first century, dogs were not cute and cuddly pets. And they were looked down on. There were a lot of packs of wild dogs. They were scavengers. And so to call someone a dog was a term of derision. In fact, the Jewish people called Gentiles dogs. And so Paul says here, he says, watch out for dogs. Watch out for evil workers. Watch out for those who mutilate the flesh. And so Paul says, there's some things I want you to be concerned about. And, and really, we could summarize that Paul was advocating here, actually, for people who were for promoting a religious experience that wasn't wholly built on and dependent on Jesus Christ. That there were people who were building a religious experience, but it was not dependent on Jesus. Notice the next verse. He says, for we are the circumcision." The ones who serve by the Spirit of God boast in Jesus Christ and do not put confidence in the flesh. So he says, we, right, and, and this is pretty amazing because he's referring to Jew and Gentile. Remember, for, for the earliest followers of Jesus, it was, it was a very Jewish movement. In fact, the world looked at it as just another sort of sect of Judaism. Right? There was just another break, break off of, of the Jewish faith and certainly it was a continuation of the promises that God made to the Israelites, to the people of God. But it was very hard for them to understand that God's grace was for everyone. Not just for the Jewish people, but for the whole world. And so here Paul says, for we, Jew and Gentile, the gospel overcomes every human division. Whether it's economic, whether it's national, whether it's race, whether it's gender, Right? The grace of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ, transcends every single human barrier. And so, so for we, he says, are the circumcision. That, the circumcision was the sign of the covenant relationship that God instituted with his people through Abraham. But now Paul's going to say circumcision takes on a different meaning, not just a physical meaning. He says, we, those that are in Christ, are the circumcisions, the one who's served by the Spirit of God. And we boast in Christ Jesus. Right? Our hope, our confidence is in Jesus alone, not in anything else. He says we put no confidence in the flesh, no confidence in ourself, no confidence in ritual or tradition or in rule keeping. Now listen, there's nothing wrong with rituals. And there's nothing wrong with tradition. In fact, many of our traditions are beautiful and they're powerful. There's nothing wrong in keeping the rules. In fact, here we expect you to do that, right? There's nothing wrong with those things. But if you're depending on those things as a basis for your faith in God, you're placing your faith in something that cannot save you and give you a genuine relationship with God. Your heritage, your denomination, your theological system is not something that you can build your faith on. Now, those things are good. We should do theology. Denominations are important and we gather with those with whom we find like-mindedness and God uses them. Your heritage matters, it's great, but it's not what you can base your faith on. Paul's about to share that neither your pedigree nor your performance can be a platform for courageous faith. Right? I want you to see this morning that your pedigree or your performance cannot be a platform for courageous faith. Look at verse 4. Paul's going to share a little bit of his testimony, a little bit of his story. He said, although I once had confidence in the flesh too. If anyone else thinks he has grounds for confidence in the flesh, I have more. 
circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, persecuting the church, as to the righteousness that is in the law, blameless. Paul says, listen, if anyone could have earned a relationship with God through their pedigree or their performance, it was me. Right? If, if anyone could have earned it by the family they were born into or where they were raised or how they grew up or how they practiced their faith, if anybody could earn a relationship with God, Paul could have. He says, I, I am a true Israelite. A true Israelite. I was circumcised on the eighth day according to the law. I'm from the tribe of Benjamin, which was an enviable ancestry if you were Jewish. He was from the right family. He was a Pharisee, something he chose to become. Right? They loved the law. They strictly interpreted God's word. They, knew, they memorized God's word. They tried to live by God's word. They were ethically consistent. And so Paul's pedigree and his performance are second to none. Right? He, he, he is a religious performer. Right? He, he has gone through all the rituals and he has done all of these things. He even persecuted to the church. And to him, that was his religious duty because this was a false sect of Judaism that was leading people away from the true worship of God in Paul's mind. And so he did everything he thought he knew to do to earn a relationship with God. And it should have been enough, but it wasn't. Paul was basing his status with God on his pedigree and his performance. And sometimes, even today, we do the same thing. I, I call it, it's the go to church on Sunday, take communion, do some nice things, and don't kill anyone approach to a relationship with God. Right? Are you with me? Right? Yeah, I, I go to church. I'm a pretty good person. Right? I, I'm assuming all of you have never killed anyone. All right? We, we're just going to go with that assumption all week. Right? But, again, what are we basing our relationship with that on? It's based on our what? Our performance. Our works. Our righteousness. We might think our, our safety is in our denomination. I'm a Baptist. I'm a Methodist. I'm a Wesleyan. I'm a Presbyterian. Right? And that's fine, but that's not the basis for your faith. Right? So look at what Paul says in verse 7. Paul says, Everything that was gained to me, I have considered to be a loss because of Christ. And more than that, I consider everything to be a loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Because of Him, I have suffered the loss of all things and consider them filth, so that I may gain Christ. Paul came to a place where he realized it was Christ and Christ alone that could make him right with God. And many of you are familiar with the story, right? It's told to us in the book of Acts. Saul was in the midst of persecuting the church. He's on his way to Damascus to round up more Christians, to have them put into prison. Right? Saul was present when Christians were executed and murdered for their faith. Saul was a religious terrorist. But God intersected his life one day, and Jesus appears to him, and he speaks to him, and he confronts him, and Paul is converted, and he comes to faith in Jesus as his Savior and his Lord and he lives his life from then on completely differently. He said, everything that was gained to me, everything that was important to me, my pedigree, my performance, my heritage, the way I practice my faith, everything that was gained to me, I have considered a loss because of Christ. He says, that all that doesn't matter anymore. I had to let go of all of that. More than that, he says, more than that, I consider everything to be a loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ. He says, it's not about performance or pedigree. It's about knowing Jesus personally, having a living relationship with Him by faith. Paul says, it's not about performance. He says, I've suffered the loss of all things and consider them filth. He says, all, all my performance, all my righteousness, all my acts of trying to do it myself and earning it, he says, that's just filth. Right? The Bible says that our righteousness, our good works that we do apart from Christ, because we, you know, there, we can do good things apart from Christ. There are people who don't know Jesus who do good things. They serve others. They care for others. They make a difference. And that's wonderful and that's good. But that is not a platform. 
for a relationship with God. We can't earn it. And so Paul says, I consider all of that filth. Our righteousness, the Bible says, is as filthy rags before God. So he says, I had to consider that a loss. You know, it's, it's a, he almost uses accounting terms here. I had to put that in the loss column. So that I may gain Christ. He had to let go of his pedigree. He had to let go of his performance in order to have a genuine relationship with Christ. You know, if your hands are full, you can't pick something else up, can you? Right? So Paul's hands were full of his performance and his pedigree, right? and he's, he's carrying them around. But in order to have Christ, he says, I've got to let that go. You, you, you have to come to the absolute end of yourself in order to experience and encounter a genuine relationship with God through faith. And realize it's not about your pedigree or your performance, but it's your position in Christ that makes you right with God. Notice verse 9. Paul says, I, I, I wanted to gain Christ, and then I wanted to be found in Him. My spiritual position is in Christ, Paul says. That's my position now. Not having a righteousness of my own from the law, but one that is through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God based on faith. So he says, I, I, I don't want to count on myself anymore. He says, I want to be found in Christ. Right? And if you have trusted and believed on Jesus as your Savior, your spiritual position is in Him. And he says, I don't have a righteousness of my own from the law, from my performance, right, from my rule keeping, from my behavior, from my, my actions. He says, my righteousness doesn't come from that. I have righteousness that is through faith in Christ, righteousness from God based on faith. He says, God has given me righteousness. And righteousness here, it means literally right standing with God. So in order to be in right standing with God, Paul says, it's not about your performance. It's not about your pedigree. It's not where you were born. It's not your denomination. It's not your zeal. It's not your passion. It's not if you do more good than, than bad that it'll all sort of weigh out. But instead, he says, it's based on faith. Your position in Christ, your legal standing with God, is not based on performance or pedigree, but position in Christ. And then Paul's going to go on to say, that then leads to a process. And we're going to talk more about that process tomorrow. But look at verse 10. He says, now that I have position in Christ, right now that my righteousness comes from God and not myself, he says, now, here's, my, here's the goal. My goal is to know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings being conformed to His death. He says, now that I'm getting my, my righteous, now that my righteousness comes from God and I'm not depending on my, my works or, or my performance anymore, now that that's happened, he says, now I have, I have a brand new aim. I have a brand new goal. I have a brand new passion. He says, my goal, the aim, the direction of my life is to know Him. Right? To, to not just be content to know that I'm forgiven, but I actually want to know the One who saved me. I want to know Him more and to know Him more deeply. He says, I want to know the power of His resurrection. Right? The same power that raised Jesus from the dead is available to you and to me. And that should cause us to rejoice because life is more difficult than you can handle. Remember, our goal is to develop an undeterred trust in God despite the danger, pain, and fear that we face. Right? There's going to become, there, and you may be there right now, but there are things in life that you will not be able to handle. Right? The old saying that God won't give you more than you can handle is not true. Right? He will always allow things in our life that are more than we can handle. Because He always wants us to realize that we don't have to handle it. Right? He is with us. He's never going to leave you nor forsake you. And His power, the resurrection power of Jesus, is available to those whose position is in Christ. And so you have power available to you to handle anything and everything that comes your way. He says, we, I want to know the power of His resurrection. And I sort of wish He would have stopped there. Right, with that, I could have just put a period right there and I would have been good because the next two things I'd rather skip over. But let's look at them because they're important. He says, I want to know Him and the power of His resurrection. And then he says, the fellowship of His sufferings. Fellowship means shared, shared life. He says, I want to have the privilege of sharing in the suffering of Christ. Right, that Jesus suffered for me. He died for me. And now He calls me sometimes to suffer for Him to give up my comforts and my privileges. Paul's writing from prison. right? He knows all too well that following Jesus does not always mean a life of comfort, ease, or safety. But he says, I want to share in that. God's called me to that, and He gives me power to handle that. And he says, I want to be conformed to His death. 
And in the death of Jesus, what do we see? Jesus was totally surrendered to the will of His Father. Right? You remember the agony that Jesus went through because He was fully God but fully man. And the night before the cross, as He began to feel the weight and bear the weight of what was about to happen as Jesus was about to take on sin and evil full force as He was about to go to the cross and the sinless Son of God was about to take your sin and my sin and the sin of the whole world on Him. That night as He went to the garden to pray, He cried out to His Father. He said, Father, if there's any other way that You can spare humanity and save them and rescue them, if there's any other way to accomplish Your plan, then let this cup of judgment pass from Me. And he prayed to his father, yet he said, nevertheless, not my will, but yours. Listen, if you ever doubt if there's any other way to God than faith in Jesus Christ, know that if there was any other way that God could save people, he would have spared his son. Because no father listening to their child begged for their life. And to beg not to go, I would do anything to protect my kids from pain and suffering. We can't always do that, and God doesn't always mean for us to do that, but that's my instinct, and it's my nature. And God, as a perfect father, loved his son perfectly. But he loved us as well. And there was no other way. And Jesus surrendered himself to the Father's plan. And he said, let this cup pass from me, but nevertheless not my will, but yours be done. Jesus totally surrendered his life to the Father. And God calls you if you're his child, if you're his follower, to live a life totally surrendered to him, conformed to his death. And Paul said, here's the motivation, here's why. Assuming that I will somehow reach the resurrection from among the dead. And and Paul wasn't, he wasn't like saying, maybe maybe somehow, perhaps, maybe I'll experience this. No, he says, I I know I'm going to experience resurrection, I just don't know how, I don't know what it's going to look like. I don't know the path that God's going to lead me there. But he says, My hope is resurrection hope. My hope is that I can endure these things and I can surrender my life to Jesus because one day I'm going to be with Him. Charles Gabriel put it like this. He says, When with the ransomed in glory, His face I at last shall see. T'will be my joy through the ages to sing of His love for me. Our motivation for knowing Christ and pursuing Him is the love that He has for us and the promise of a future with Him. Listen, neither your pedigree nor your performance can be a platform for a courageous faith and a genuine relationship with God. And so I just want to ask you this morning to really, just to be honest with yourself and say, do I have a genuine relationship with Jesus Christ by faith? Have I experienced His grace by simply coming to Him with open hands and saying, God, I need you I need you. I can't do this. I can't save myself. I need you, Jesus. Forgive me. Save me. Make me your child. And then I want to ask you a couple questions. Are you clothing yourself in your own righteousness? Are you clothing yourself in your own righteousness? Because even if you have a genuine relationship with Jesus and you're truly saved and, 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 and nothing ever separates you from God, but sometimes, even in that, we start imagining that it's about our performance and that we try to clothe ourselves in our own righteousness. And I want to ask you this, are you trying to please Him through your performance? Are you trying to please God through your performance? Because here's the thing I want you to know. You don't have to try to please God through your performance. Yes, God calls you to obey Him and to trust Him by faith, but you don't have to earn His love. Right? It, it, you, don't have, you cannot earn He loves you so much. Right? And His love is never based on how you're doing. His love isn't based on whether you prayed today or read your Bible today. His love isn't based on whether you practiced two hours today, but you should. Because our love might be. <laughs> Just kidding. Just want to see if you're still awake. But God's love is never based, never based on performance. And listen, that's incredibly freeing. It's incredibly freeing. And so I just want to ask you this. What do you need to let go? Is there something you need to let go of that you're holding on to in order to have a genuine relationship with Christ? Or maybe you have a genuine relationship with Christ, but, but you're trying to hold on to something and maybe God's calling you to let that go. 
So let me pray for us this morning. Father in heaven, I thank you for your word, which is living and powerful and true. And Father, I I pray that everyone here in this room would know the love that you have for them and offer them through your son, Jesus Christ, and that they would know that they can freely and fully experience that by faith through grace. And and that that by placing their faith in you, they can experience your grace and your forgiveness and your mercy and have a genuine relationship with you. Father, forgive us for the times where even after we've experienced that relationship, where we try to earn your love or earn your favor or think that it's about performance or about something external. Help us to, to let go of those things. And Father, may we have the attitude in the heart of Paul. May we have a hunger and desire to know you. May we, may we encounter and experience your resurrection power in our life because we can't live for you alone. Father, may we be willing to share in the fellowship of your sufferings. And Father, may we be conformed to the death of Jesus. May we have a surrendered heart and attitude to you. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.